Hey there team, Chemistry Coach coming at ya for video number two in our journey into what is matter. Hopefully, hopefully this is review for you guys that you've just read about on your own or makes intuitive sense to you. But let's get down to this particulate view of how, how chemists work. We're going to slowly get you into that way of thinking. So we want to look at properties of matters. So we're going to break that down first into what we call states of matter. I'm sure you remember gas, liquid, solid. Uh, you may, uh, you've probably seen the AQ symbol, something dissolved in water. We're going to look at the three fundamental ones. A lot of people um, use states or phases interchangeably. Uh, technically, a little bit different. The states would be solid, liquid, gas. Phases... That'll get a little bit uh, weirder when we move later on down our journey, get into these polymorphic things where you have uh, like ice, for example, depending on the pressure, you might get three or four different types of ice, the way the atoms or particles are arranged. So those are different phases. You get like phase one, phase two, phase three, ice, those kinds of things. Um, so states is probably a better term to use for solid liquid gas, but I'm okay if we interchange those, whether you see here we say state or phase, not the end of the world, all right? So let's take a look just from an atomic point of view and then macroscopically we, what, what we see. Solids, of course, you know, we know what solids look like, right? Got this fork here, you know, I, well, actually I'm too weak now. <laughs> I'm in my 50s now. I can't even bend the fork anymore. I don't think my wife would like if I bent her nice fork. <laughs> but we can see that the shape of this is, is constant, right? Uh, the volume of this is constant. I can put this in a beaker. Plunk, it's not going to, it's not going to conform to the shape and volume of the beaker. Just bump the fork just sits in there, right? Which is good because we want it to stay the same shape and volume. So something about the particulate nature, the mic so macroscopically we see this. Microscopically, those particles that make up that solid must be very rigid, right? Very tightly held together. We're going to look at those forces and the energetics much later on in our journey. But you can kind of view a solid, whatever those particles are, somewhat remotely looking like that. Very tightly packed particles in there. They don't move around. They might vibrate a little bit, maybe jiggle a little bit. You can't see it, but on the atomic level, they're blah, 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 vibrating. But they're not moving laterally. Don't think of them that way. Liquids, on the other hand, I'm sure you're very familiar. So I got myself, you don't know what liquid this is. A lot of liquids look like water. <laughs> so don't just drink it. If you, It could be hydrogen peroxide. It could be some kind of hydrochloric acid. Don't just drink it thinking it's water. So you never eat or drink anything in chemistry lab. No, no, no. Not good. So liquids, you know, so I've got a bit of liquid here. Well, this is my favorite state, by the way, because you get things like crazy straws invented. Because I can just pour this into another container and it conformed to the shape of that container. But the volume's the same. So I still have, you know, roughly, I don't have my glasses on me, about 26 milliliters here. So if I pour it back into here, I've still got about 26 milliliters, right? Going back and forth, that volume doesn't change. So for a liquid, the volume's constant, but the shape conforms to whatever container it is. That's why you can suck liquid through a crazy straw. Remember crazy straws? <sighs> Woo! Right? And you can put it in these really weird, you go to, I, I love to go to Las Vegas and you're walking down the street, you see all these crazy containers liquids can go in with these cuckoo straws. It's so much fun. Liquids are so cool. But the, the shape conforms to the volume does not. So what does that tell us? That's macroscopically what we see. But from an atomic level, from a, a microscopic level, those particles that make up that liquid must be able to move around a little bit. Not enough where they can separate from each other, right? Because that volume doesn't change. So they're kind of stuck. But they must be a little more spread apart than the solid is because they can move and conform to the shape of the container, but not enough where they separate the distances between those particles, right? We'll talk about if we, that's for constant temperature. We'll talk later. Uh, if you change the temperature, that's different. You can get what you may have heard of, you know, thermal expansion and contraction. That's a whole different ball game, my friends. We're just talking all the state, you know, whatever the conditions are, they're set, okay? So it's set temperature or something. Now gas, of course, you've, Whoa, breathe in. You're breathing gas every day and sometimes even emitted, emitting it after having a bad burrito or something. <laughs> so we all know something about gases. If you're having, you know, you have a bad burrito or whatever and you're in the car driving with your friends or even worse on a first date, 
<laughs> there's some commercial that did that too, where they're on a first date, and the uh, I think as the guy goes back into the house to get something, and you just boom, and this lady just goes, "Oh no!" Because you know that gas doesn't have constant volume; it doesn't sit there in a little cloud and float around like this. It disperses out so everybody can enjoy it, right? And those particles go up your nose. You know, you get this uh, this signal to your brain going, "Ooh, uh, you went to some uh, burrito factory, or had a bad egg, or something." <laughs> Anyway, I'll be like this all semester long. I apologize, right? Or some of you might come stay with me for the whole year of general chemistry. So obviously something's different about gases where those particles spread out, right? So they can form to the shape and the volume of whatever container they're in. So those particles must be very, very separated from each other and able to move independently, right? So the shape can conform and the volume can conform so they can disperse out. So I actually have some iodine. One of my favorite elements, by the way, is iodine. Because you have a solid iodine there. We'll talk about phase changes. This is called sublimation. I don't know if you can see that purple vapor that's in there. It's pretty cool. Right? So that sublimes directly to a gas at room temperature. And that gas immediately conforms to the shape and volume of that whole container. And if I put this iodine into a different container, it would conform to that container, right? Oh, oh, I hope you can see that faint purple on there. Oh, I just love iodine. Sublimes at room temperature to this. Uh, purple's my favorite color. So you just get this beautiful purple gas. And whatever container it's in, it spreads out to that. Now, obviously, if I don't trap it in a container, those gas particles would just go floop out in the atmosphere and spread and disperse in the atmosphere. And then, you know, then you can't see, can't see them anymore. They're gone. So anyway, solid liquid gas. And a lot of times you'll see us use these symbols for these. So you'll see this symbol with an S in parentheses or an L in parentheses or a G. So whenever we have some form of matter, a lot of times we'll put a parentheses with an S, an L, or a G there to represent the state that, that it's in at that temperature and under the conditions stated. All right, let's get into some properties now that we can view things from both a macroscopic and a microscopic level. All right, let's take a look at properties of matter and just fundamentally break them down into two categories, physical or chemical. You're going to see this through your chemical journey. We'll break things down and go, hey, was that a physical thing or was that a chemical thing? Sounds like dating almost, right? <laughs> so there, um, fundamentally how we're going to look at a physical versus a chemical property or a change. We're going to look at changes in matter. Ultimately, we're going to, you know, hopefully look, hey, there was that, that matter changed. Uh, was that physical or chemical? And the question underlying that to a chemist would be, did that involve a change in the identity of the substance or what we call the composition, the makeup of the particles? So if you alter the makeup of the particles and rearrange them in a particular way to create a new substance, you've changed its identity that now has new chemical and physical properties. And we can see that macroscopically in a lot of times. Our eyes aren't the, you know, our pathetic human eyeballs aren't the best detectors, but they're pretty good. So think of something physical as no change in its composition, its particulate makeup, no change in its identity. Think of something physical as something that changes its composition or particular makeup, changing its identity. So a chemical property is a property that shows a tendency to undergo a change in composition or a change in identity. Whereas a physical property is just an inherent characteristic that does not include a change in its composition or identity. So some fun ones, solubility, right? We looked at our water here. You all know you take salt, drop that salt in the, into that water, mix it up, blah, 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 it's gone, right? Not everything. I stick this fork in here, that doesn't dissolve, okay? So now, and I could vaporize this water and get my salt back. Oh, see that? So we're going to be talking about physical and chemical changes later. Um, so solubility is an inherent characteristic of matter, right? I can change the amount of that salt or whatever, and it's not going to, you know, change the fact that it still dissolves. Uh, magnetism's a fun one. These fascinated me when I was a kid, right? You're like, oh, 
Ooh, that's so much fun. You could, I, mean, I, I used to spend hours flipping magnets to put the south to the south pole. And I'd be like, get my grandma's house. And you know how you get them to the opposite poles. You can't put them together. They repel each other. I'd literally tape one to the floor and t put another one on the bottom of my foot and try to smash them together and it would zing across the kitchen floor. Oh, the things you do as a kid. But you can have a lot of fun. So not everything shows magnetic behavior, right? And it's not changing its identity. I haven't changed its its composition or makeup, right? This is still exactly the same. So magnetism, malleability, right? You all use aluminum foil, see that? So malleability is the ability to take certain types of uh, solids and smash them flat. So this aluminum foil is great. I used tin foil back in my day, uh, but now you use aluminum foil. So being able to smash something, we're gonna learn something later called the gold foil experiment, one of the key ones later to discover the atomic nucleus took advantage of the physical property of gold that it's malleable. Like my, I am my gold tooth. Ha 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 ha. what happens. Uh, I tell my kids all the time, if they don't want to go to the dentist, look what happens. Ah, if you don't go to the dentist, you end up getting your tooth drilled away and they take malleable gold, blah, 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 smash it in there. They don't really do gold too much anymore. You get something a little bit different. So it doesn't look like my tooth. Uh, conductivity. You ever discover this as a kid? You know what I'm thinking? You know what I'm thinking? You're a kid. You see the hole in the wall called a socket, and you go, oh, this would, oh, <laughs> you find out real quick what conductivity is. Well, not everything's going to conduct electricity or heat. Back in my day, you know, the pans didn't have the, uh, the insulated, uh, like, uh, whatever the heck it is. I'm not a cook in any way. I can cook cereal. That's about it. But the pans were, had metal handles, and if you touched it, you're a little three-year-old kid. Oh, what's up? Oh, you know what conductivity is of heat pretty fast. That's why we had, you know, pot holders and things like that. So today, a lot of them have that rubbery type of insulated handle so you don't burn your hand. Great invention, by the way. But to the demise of many kids who were born in the 60s, uh, early 70s, psh, oh, you learn real fast. Pain's a great motivator. <laughs> right? uh, you know, mass, density, volume, boiling points. You know, it, it, these are all just physical properties of metal. Uh, not a metal, of matter. Now, I can't take these magnets out of my hand. They're fun to play with. Uh, chemical properties, again, I'm not going to demo these in my own place here, but flammability, right? Certain things have a tendency to go wada bing, wada boom, right? So I was uh, demoing hydrogen gas once and, you know, put it in a big balloon like this and lit it up with a cigarette lighter and blew up in my face. That wasn't a smart demo, but I showed what flammability was. Think Hindenburg or something, right? But not everything does. We know oxygen gas, right? If you just have to get oxygen gas, it's good to breathe, right? That wouldn't be true for something else, but it's not going to, nitrogen gas, it's not going to explode. Hydrogen will, right? Tennessee's to rust, right? We've all seen rust. I grew up in the Midwest and all the cars had little rust holes in the bottoms there because of the salt and stuff. There's some fascinating chemistry going on, but the certain type of metal tended to rust were other types of metals, especially you know, like on airplanes, wouldn't it be a bummer and say, oh, hey, mom, what's that hole building through the uh, wing there? Oh, it's just rust. Don't worry about it. That wouldn't be good in an airplane, right? So they get to use different kinds of metals with different kinds of chemical properties. Things that react with water. I had a horrifically awesome experience with sodium in water. Not once, not twice, three times. I'm a slow learner. But, oh, man, I, I put way too big of a chunk of sodium into a sink of water. And that was the end of that ceiling. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Boom. So I found out real quick that sodium reacts quite violently with water. But if I stick this fork in there, it's just boring. It just plops to the bottom. didn't do anything. So bad things can turn out to make good stories. So I learned chemical versus physical properties just by doing stuff in lab I probably shouldn't have been doing and probably shouldn't be telling you about. So please don't do any unsanctioned experiments without proper, su proper supervision from uh, a, a proper chemical coach. All right. Uh, <laughs> so let's look at changes real quick. Let's just extend this to physical and chemical changes. And then we'll look at another video on how do we classify the different forms and types of matter. I could talk all day long. So before we get into chemical and physical changes, I just wanted to throw something at you. You don't hear it very often, but might as well. It only takes a minute or less to go through it. You might hear these terms, intensive versus extensive properties. What do those mean? It's a very kind of a broader way of looking at it. It doesn't matter if it's chemical or physical properties. 
But intensive properties are properties of matter that are independent. Notice the in and in. That's how I remember that. Independent of the amount of that matter. Whereas extensive properties depend on the amount of matter. So that property will change if you change the amount of matter. Whereas an intensive one, you could double the amount of matter and it won't change the property. So if I take this water and I, it'll have a certain boiling point, certain mass, volume rate. If I double it, how does, does the property change, right? So if I double that amount of water, would the mass change? Well, yeah, there's more particles. Would the volume change? Well, yeah, it seems to make sense. So mass and volume are extensive properties. They're dependent on the amount of that particular substance. But the melting point and boiling point, right? You should know that water boils at 100 degrees Celsius, or we'll talk about temperature later, 212 degrees Fahrenheit. That's not going to change if I double the amount of water. So melting and boiling points are intensive properties. Density we'll get into later. Density is the amount of the mass divided by the volume, the number of particles crammed in a particular three-dimensional region of space. So the more particles you can cram in the same space, the more dense it will be. And we'll talk about that later. Density is a huge thing in chemistry. But that won't change. If I if I double the volume and double the mass, right? But the ratio of those would stay constant. So the density doesn't change based on the amount. Flammability, right? These are physical properties. That's a chemical property, right? Hydrogen gas doesn't matter if you got one milliliter or 20 milliliters or, you know, a huge balloon or a small balloon. It's still going to go boom, boom, okay? That won't change. It doesn't alter. So just wanted to introduce intensive versus extensive before we get into uh, chemical and physical changes next. Let's look at some of these chemical and physical changes. Now that we uh, know chemical properties, right, involve the tendency to undergo a change in composition or identity, and physical properties, which are just inherent characteristics that don't undergo a change, right? I can, you know, you know, we're going to look at changes. If I if I change something, but it doesn't change its identity, that would be physical. If I change something and it changes its identity, i.e. its composition, that's chemical. Go back to what I taught you earlier. Physical, no change in composition or identity. Chemical, change in composition or change in identity. So physical changes, of course, there's no change in composition or identity. Chemical, there is a change. And we can see that when we do labs. We're going to look at, hey, let's do this in lab. And then from what we see or perceive, can we conclude that was a chemical change or a physical change? It's a very common introductory laboratory. And a lot of times you can see, you can, you can say, hey, that was a chemical change because I saw a change in a property, right? The color changed. If it was a physical change, the color wouldn't have changed. But if it goes from yellow to purple, hello, that must be a new substance. See what I'm saying? Or the, maybe the odor changes. Maybe it was odorless and then all of a sudden it smells like rotten eggs. Man, that must be because a new substance formed. You see the, the, the interaction between the theory and what you actually perceive in a laboratory. That's what, that's, chemistry can be challenging for some people because it's a combination of both. It's not just theoretical learning. You've got to go into the laboratory and do it, see it, understand it, and then you can go, ah, oh, I see the connection between the macroscopic, what I see, and the microscopic, what we learn in the lecture hall. We want to make that connection. That's what gets you to a higher level in chemistry. So what would be some common physical changes, right? Well, we talked about malleability, right? Right. So I got this little aluminum foil. <gasps> oh, I changed it, right? It's different, different shape. But I didn't change the composition. It's still aluminum foil, right? Just because I do this or crumple it up, I didn't change its identity. That's a physical change, you know? Ripping paper up, right? Smashing aluminum, just take the aluminum can, oh, oh, my head, right? It's still an aluminum can. It didn't alter its identity. So you get the feel for it. But I want to list through some real common ones that are physical. The physical changes called phase changes. Remember, we look at solids, liquids, and gas. Well, if I have water as an ice cube and I heat it up and melt it into liquid, it's still water, right? I haven't changed its composition. I just changed its phase. That's a physical change, right? And if I keep heating up the water, I can boil it to a gas. New phase. See what's happening there? But it has not changed its identity. So phase changes fall under the category of physical changes. So what I want you to do, my guess is you probably, whether you've had science or chemistry or not over your lifespan, 
whether it's a longer one like mine or a briefer one, you should be able to nail out at least five of these. I want you to pause this video, list, well, pause it after I tell you what to do <laughs> or suggest what you do. List as many phase changes as you know off the top of your head and then tell me what the original phase is and the final phase after the change. Does it go from a solid to a liquid? Does it go from a gas to a solid or something like that? See if you can, you should be able to nail out four. If you can get five, I'll be impressed. If you can get six, I'm super impressed. No cheating, no Googling, nothing. Don't phone a friend. Do it right off the top of your head. I'll pause it myself and write them down. Let's see if we get the same thing. How many did you get? Let's find out. Testing what's in your brain. You'll find out you got a lot of chemistry in your brain. You don't even know it. Right? We're just going to organize it a little different. All right, melting. I hope you got that one right. You leave an ice cube out. Blah, 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 blah. It's a liquid now. Oh, my gosh. We'll talk about the energetics of that in a much later journey. So solid to liquid. Solid phase to liquid phase. We're melting it, right? Well, the reverse of that, right? Cool it down. Liquid to solid. It's freezing. You put the, the water, liquid water tray in the freezer, right? Some people call that solidification as well. That's okay. So we've got melting and freezing. Condensation. This is uh, why somebody invented a coaster and became probably a multi-billionaire, <laughs> right? Because you'll sit there, you know, you're watching the Super Bowl or whatever, or, you know, your, your favorite show. I'm into 12 Monkeys right now. Whoa, it's such a cool show. I love anything with time travel, the Terminator, uh, Umbrella Academy. I love all this stuff, right? So I take my favorite beverage, uh, put some ice cubes in it, set it down. And if it's just sitting on a wood, over what happens, Right. Gas phase water molecules strike the surface of your uh, you know, glass and then they condense into a liquid and bead down and then you get this little ring of liquid that's on there that leaves these little rings all over your wood table, right? That's why the coaster was invented and simple little things. Somebody got amazingly wealthy off that. Good for them. They, they you know, made life better for billions of people. Good for them. Well, the opposite of that, evaporation, right? It rains out, well, I'm in Southern California. It might rain next year, <laughs> right? But when it does, we go, oh, whoa, there's a liquid puddle. What's that? Kids, kids, come look, a puddle, a puddle. You haven't seen that since you were born. But that puddle doesn't sit there forever, and it doesn't boil. We'll find out later, you know, uh, evaporation and boiling are, you know, two sides of the same coin, but they're a little bit different. You never actually see, if you actually see a puddle boiling, run <laughs> that's not good <laughs> your death is you have an impending doom like death coming up right but it peels off in layers as the gas as the liquid becomes a gas and disperses into the atmosphere we're going to talk really heavily about that much later on down the road we got to learn about things called intermolecular forces the forces between the particles but i'm sure you know those first four i'm pretty sure all of you got the first four if you got sublimation, I'm impressed. My favorite phase change, right? We brought up that iodine before. How it goes directly at room temperature from the solid, you see the solid in there, to the gas. I love this stuff, right? Uh, mothballs when I was a kid. You go into my grandma's closet, right? Because when, when soda pop first came out, call it pop over in the Midwest. Get some pop. I'd never had it before. And she would hide it in her in her coat closet. It was this big walk-in closet. But it had mothballs in there. And and I just, you know, right when I smell, oh, I know the smell. I think they're actually carcinogenic. It might cause cancers or that's why I got some issues. But I would, you know, when I was there, I would sneak in there. And she, oh, what was, I can't remember what the pop was. I, oh, I can't remember what it was. The, it was some weird taste, but I go and just, oh, the bubbly fun, you know, the things you sneak around. You, they probably knew I was doing it. Your parents and grandparents always know what you're doing. It's just a matter of should they tell you or are they just laughing about it because they did it too, <laughs> right? Uh, but yeah, I know I can tell the smell of mothballs, man, right off the top of my head. Um, a fun one I do when I do science fairs is uh, dry ice, which is really not ice. It's solid carbon dioxide, that sublimes immediately into a gas. It's really cool. And it really hurts when you hold it in your hand. Don't be stupid like me and grab dry ice and hold it in your hand and go, oh! <laughs> I actually had a student film that. They're like, oh, look at the blisters for I just do what I say, not what I do. All right. Uh, and then if you got this last one, I'm supremely impressed. Deposition. Gases that can, you know, see that it's an atmospheric chemistry sometimes. A gas can deposit directly into a solid on like uh, the solids, the surfaces of leaves, 
or of plants, of surfaces, of buildings and whatnot. So you don't hear about deposition much in general chemistry, but in atmospheric chemistry you might. Um, but make sure you know these. These are important when we're talking about it. Chemical changes, of course, usually are pretty obvious. There's usually there's commonly a noticeable change in energy that accompanies it. Um, but, you know, you know, if you rip paper, it doesn't change the identity. So it's physical. But you burn it? Woo, that's fun. Whoa, you get the ash, and you can see all it and smells it. So it you get this blackish ash after you're done. It's not the white paper. You can see the color's different. Everything. That is definitely a new substance, right? So we call that combustion in chemistry. That's like the formal way of saying burn it. We're going to talk a lot about combustion. Rust formation. Like I said, that happened a lot when I grew up in the Midwest. You'd see rust, things would rust all the time. Um, but not every metal rusts. Right? But when you see rust form, that rust is a new substance. Right? It's got di different chemical and physical properties from the original metal. Decomposition. Right? Something, you know, my favorite plant, Fred, dies, and no, oh, it goes bye-bye over time, right? A, 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 you know, a bird dies or something, it doesn't look the same a year later, right? There's kind of a general rule of thumb. It doesn't always work, but if you're stuck and going, was that physical change or chemical change? Commonly, physical changes can be, are easily reversible, right? I can freeze water and remelt it again. Same with that? So, so you, it's kind of reversible, whereas the chemical ones macroscopically a lot of the ones that we see don't appear to be reversible right so you know decomposition you don't see uh you know a, a, a living organism decay and then come back again right uh digestion is a chemical process you don't eat your breakfast think about what you had for breakfast this morning right it's not quite reversible okay you know it goes through your digestive system comes up goes what you didn't use goes in the potty can you take what was in the potty reverse that process and have your breakfast come back up it's not gonna happen okay so if you're stuck and you don't know what to do go is it reversible if not probably chemical if it is probably physical but that's not a hundred percent useful but it can be in times of trouble on a test um, so we call those chemical reactions. So a chemical change is a chemical reaction. You've altered something's composition and identity. Therefore, you have new physical and chemical properties commonly you can see with your eyes. Let's classify matter in the next one, my friends. Study!